Grammar Girl is brought to you by Magoosh. Do your career goals require you to take a standardized test like the GRE or GMAT? Magoosh Online Test Prep provides you with the tools you need to get a great score, like study schedules, up-to-date practice questions, video lessons, and support from expert tutors. Study anywhere, anytime, on desktop or mobile. Visit magoosh.com and enter the promo code GRAMMAR for a 20% discount. Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty. This week, I have a quick and dirty tip to help you remember the difference between the two spellings of the word council. Another quick and dirty tip about when you put single words like yes and no in quotation marks. And a meaty middle about oxymorons. Let's get started with council. Both council, C-I-L, and council, S-E-L, ultimately go back to the same Latin word, concilium. And Etymology Online says people have been confusing these two words ever since the 16th century. Council, C-I-L, is a noun that describes a group of decision makers. The council took months to reach a decision about who should be held accountable for the confetti incident. Council, S-E-L, is a verb that means to give advice. And it's also a noun describing the advice received as a result of counseling. For example, a lawyer gives legal counsel or legal advice. Here's an example of counsel as a verb. Squiggly hoped the nutritionist wouldn't counsel him to give up chocolate. Here's a quick and dirty tip. Think of the S-E-L on the end of counsel the verb as similar to sell, S-E-L-L, another verb, an action. Salespeople may try to counsel you so they can sell you a certain product. And there's a short quiz on these two words on the transcript of this segment at quickanddirtytips.com if you want to test your knowledge. Just search the site for either spelling of counsel. Next, we'll figure out when you need to put single words like yes and no in quotation marks. It all boils down to whether you're dealing with a direct quotation or an indirect quotation. A direct quotation is when you're directly quoting what someone said, word for word, not paraphrasing. You put direct quotations in quotation marks. So if you were hanging out with Squiggly at Ghirardelli Square and you asked him if he wanted some chocolate-covered cashews and he looked at you with big eyes and simply said, yes, you could later report to Aardvark that Squiggly said yes and you'd put that in quotation marks since that's exactly what he said. On the other hand, an indirect quotation is when you're reporting what someone said, but not exactly. You're paraphrasing, and you don't need to put indirect quotations in quotation marks. So let's imagine again that you were hanging out with Squiggly in Ghirardelli Square, but this time, when you asked him if he wanted some chocolate-covered cashews, he said, Oh my gosh, you can't imagine how much I want chocolate-covered cashews. I was just looking at them and drooling. Thank you. You might again report to Aardvark that you offered Squiggly chocolate-covered cashews, and he said yes. But this time, you wouldn't put yes in quotation marks because Squiggly didn't actually say the word yes. You're just paraphrasing his dramatically positive response. Sometimes it can be a little confusing to decide whether to use quotation marks. But remember that the trick is to figure out whether the person literally said the words yes or no, in which case you need quotation marks. Or if you're just conveying the general sense of a positive or negative response, you don't need quotation marks. Before we get to our meaty middle about oxymorons, podcast listeners are invited to take advantage of Casper's competitive, limited-time Memorial Day sale offer. Start your summer off right by choosing the Internet's favorite mattress this Memorial Day. With three lines to choose from, including the original Casper, the Innovative Wave, and the Streamlined Essential, every Casper mattress is designed to help you sleep cool and regulate your body temperature throughout the night. Plus, you can be sure of your purchase with Casper's 100-night risk-free sleep-on-it trial. And returns are hassle-free if you're not completely satisfied. I can tell you from sleeping on it that it really is soft, and yet you also feel it supporting your body. 
And it's fun to see it pop out of the box when you first get it, too. For a limited time, visit casper.com slash savings and receive 10% off your order with any mattress purchase. This special offer expires May 29th, 2018, and terms and conditions apply. That's casper.com slash savings to receive 10% off your order with any mattress purchase, valid until May 29th. And now, on to oxymorons. We recently talked about Janus words, also known as contronyms, which are words that have two opposite meanings. An example is dust, which means to add a light layer, as in I dusted the cake with powdered sugar. It also means to remove dust, as in I dusted the bookshelf. Weird, huh? This got us thinking about something we'll call oxymoronic words. Words that are compounds formed from two words with opposite meanings. For example, bittersweet and cryocaustic, which combines a prefix meaning to freeze with a root meaning to burn. Another example is the word oxymoron itself, which combines parts meaning sharp and dull. We decided to explore a few of these oxymoronic words, and we started with one that has bugged us for years, spendthrift. How do you know what this word is supposed to mean? The spend portion suggests extravagance, that someone is spending a lot. But the thrift portion says the opposite, that someone is being thrifty. Well, the first choice is correct. A spendthrift is someone who burns through money. This word makes more sense when you know that an earlier meaning of thrift was savings. So spendthrifts are spending their savings. An earlier and more silly-sounding phrase was ding-thrift. The ding part means to deal heavy blows, to knock, hammer, or thump. And thrift, as we know, can also refer to the cautious spending of money. So people who are ding-thrifts destroy their budget. Maybe we need a campaign to bring back ding-thrift in place of spend-thrift. Fail-safe is another weird word. Does it refer to something that's failing or something that's safe? To understand, it helps to know how the word evolved. The first recorded uses were from the 1950s in airplane and engineering manuals. The word was used as a verb-adjective combination, as engineers discussed ways to help aircraft to fail safe instead of fail dangerous. Would it have been more correct to discuss the aircraft failing safely? Of course, but language doesn't always evolve in correct or logical ways. New ways of speaking often emerge from slang and shortcuts like this. Over time, the verb to fail safe experienced what we call a functional shift. It shifted parts of speech and came to be used as a noun. For example, a recent article about a giant female python discovered in the Everglades described how scientists put, quote, two radio transmitters, a GPS device, and a motion-sensing device, unquote, on the snake. Apparently, quote, the second radio transmitter was a fail-safe, ensuring she wouldn't go wild again, unquote. So when you're trying to remember what this word means, think of its origin. Picture a plane failing safe and gliding to the ground, rather than failing dangerous and crashing. A fail-safe keeps something safe. Finally, bridegroom may be the weirdest oxymoronic word of all. We already have the word groom, which refers to a man who's getting married. Why confuse things by adding the word bride? Just like before, knowing the word's origin helps us understand. The first version of this word was bridegooma, with bride spelled B-R-Y-D. This was formed by combining the Old English word bride, which had the sense of bridal or wedding, and the word guma, meaning man. Hence, a bridegooma was a wedding man or a bridesman. Over time, bridegooma evolved into bridegoom. But as Old English slowly changed into Middle English, the word gome became obsolete. There was, however, a strangely similar word, grome, referring to a boy or lad. Somehow, the word grome began to be used in this term, and bridegroom was formed. By this time, bride was spelled the way we do today, B-R-I-D-E, and groom is simply short for bridegroom. The Oxford English Dictionary has Shakespeare as the first writer to use the shortened form 
groom in Othello and Cymbeline in the early 1600s. That segment was written by Samantha Enslin, who runs Dragonfly Editorial. You can find her at dragonflyeditorial.com or on Twitter as Dragonfly Edit. Thank you to Shushnig, who listens in the car in Argentina, and friend of Enos, who's a former high school English teacher. And also thank you to Technicat and MK Online for the nice reviews on Apple Podcasts. Remember, if you'd like an ad-free version of this podcast, access to the entire ad-free archive of about 600 episodes, and an exclusive monthly bonus episode, you can get all that through Stitcher Premium. Sign up for a free trial to get not only all my goodies, but stuff from other great podcasts, too, like Marvel's Wolverine the Long Night. Sign up at stitcherpremium.com slash grammar and use the offer code grammar. I'm Mignon Fogarty. Grammar Girl is part of the Quick and Dirty Tips podcast network, which I founded way back in 2006. And you can find me as Grammar Girl on Twitter and Facebook. That's all. Thanks for listening. Bye.